Okay, uh, maybe we have uh, one or two follow-up questions, and then uh, we all go to lunch. I read a document uh, which was a leak from Stratfor uh, on an article written in a newspaper from Barcelona. And it described a surveillance machine within uh, Catalonia which was cooperating between different nations. So it described, for instance, that um, Indians would be monitored by Indian intelligence with the cooperation of Spain, and they would kind of coordinate uh, all of the all of the different uh, surveillance needs among different communities within uh, Catalonia. And I wanted to know, or know if there's any information about actually a lot of these systems are in cooperation rather than in competition, which is which is an outlook uh, th th that we we assume that these nations are in competition. Yeah, let's, let's some more questions. We just get first get the questions, yeah, and then one round of answers. Thank you. Um, my name is Peter Bale, and I'd like to ask a, a sort of elephant in the room question, if possible, um, from, probably from James and Duncan, but picking up on something that Maria said as well. Is the is the issue here? I mean, when Truman set up the NSA, he presumably did it because he felt it would protect American citizenry at some point. Is the issue here really the one that Maria mentions about transparency, that this, all of this is being done in our own names, or is it the fact it's done at all? I'd just love to address that sort of slightly philosophical question, because the, the foundations of this were, were presumably with some good intent, not just a spectre of control. Any other questions? I guess I want to put out maybe a little challenge. I work in health information technology, and um, one of the problems we're having in healthcare in the United States, but also around the world, is that it's hard to get the right information about a patient to help them. Um, and it's not just health information, almost any part of your life could be related to healthcare. The more we push for protecting privacy in a very narrow way, the more we also make people vulnerable. And I think the current state of health information technology is horrible and scary. I think I want to just go back to what Cy Hurst said, which is um, these people are going to do a lot of damaging, horrible things no matter what. We should not put our lives at stake um, for this. We need to find some way to control this. I don't mean to belittle any of the things that people have been saying. They're very important. But I think we need to understand the value of data in, for people's livelihoods, for improving people's lives, especially in rural areas. Um, <clears throat> it's another important thing to be considered. Yes, tomorrow Karen Spike will speak about this in the session about methods of investigation. Okay, last two questions. I keep track, you keep track too. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ian Puddock. I blog and tweet uh, about police corruption and lack of police accountability. Uh, my question is, the, the police are in a unique position uh, away from the public because they swear an oath to uphold the law where are the police in this? Because a lot of government officials, bureaucrats, are there because of what they do, but they don't actually swear this unique oath. And I just wonder where the police were in holding these people to account when they break the law. Last question here. Yeah, I'd um, be interested to get your views on government-sponsored um, industrial espionage in terms of the trade agreements in particular. Um, with the, both the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the TTIP. And my really imp question is that I would really like you also to address the whole privatisation of this uh, intelligence business, that it's all outsourced. That's e very scary, even more. OK, I guess we, uh, you can handle another five minutes before lunch? Yes? Good. No way? Well, no way leaves now, and we just take another five to ten. You have three minutes? Okay, and you go. Duncan, please. Um, Pick <coughs> one and uh, address it. Uh, so I was trying to keep a note uh, and then just give a sort of integrated response. To the, the council, uh, a colleague from Catalonia, 
Um, I would say go and look at what's put out there by um, Big Brother Watch and Privacy International. There's a lot of stuff, and you, you'll be able to give more information on the private companies. There's a lot of companies emulating the kind of kit that NSA, GCHQ, and others have developed and putting it out there, and you can get information on that. And it sounds like that's what you were looking at. Uh, to the uh, colleagues talking about health, yes. Um, we're not going to get away from the fact that our, our lives run on data, and they're going to run on more data. So closing it down, not providing health care, or taking the Cy Hirsch solution to medical needs in the 21st century isn't going to be for your doctor. He's got to write it down. It's got to go on a computer. How do we deal with that is the issue. The policing question raises a more grave thing, which um, we can only hint at. Maybe some other people can pick it up later. But because these SIGINT people have created an empire of data, whether they're partly functional, I think James was suggesting, or wholly dysfunctional, as I was suggesting, they certainly have all of those elements. But they've created this stream, and they haven't got people fighting wars anymore to fund their budgets. So what they are, the transition they're in is not just trying to change laws around the world to build this intelligence multinational, which I suspect is what you just told us happened in India. Five years from now, you'll probably find that NSA's Foreign Affairs Division created these laws and caused them to come into place. So the drive is to take... Um, the secret surveillance still protected by the intelligence and secrecy and push it through the criminal justice system to bring prosecutions and people to trial. Now, Sai, I think, hinted at that. I think we all of us here on the panel know of examples of that. And that is the process they're trying to do. Indeed, one article in The Intercept that uh, a colleague uh, did, Ryan Gallagher, was about a, an intelligence community outreach pro program to push this data there. Now, this is the greatest travesty of our system simply because it defeats what justice is about. It makes it invisible, unaccountable. It under, it undermines constitution. That's an area you've got to watch. Uh, and to Peter, who asked probably a sort of overriding question, I incline to what I think, James, in your article, you said NSA is there for legitimate purposes, that's being recognized. Uh, there are goods uh, to be derived, but no accountability, no proper law, no transparency, uh, and you have a rogue system that does all kinds of things. They do not have the courage. They berate us, they raid us, they got us to smash our hard drives, they criticize us, but they do not have the courage to come out in open debate and actually achieve what uh, they say we should respect, yes, there are limits to privacy, but there are limits to surveillance. And you can't have a debate when not only is there secrecy and no accountability, but they'll arrest you, jail you, punish you, prosecute you, hound you and your sources if you try to find out and report. That's the way, yeah. um, in response to a question up there um, with regards to transparency, um, of course, it's not only about transparency. Um, on the one hand, transparency is, is very important in the sense that if you don't know what systems actually exist, if you don't know that you've actually been spied on, if you don't know how these systems work and who's in charge of them and all the other details that come with that, then how are you supposed to challenge that legally or in any other way? So in that sense, um, I emphasize that transparency is important. Uh, well, that's one of the reasons, at least. But of course, it's, it's not only about transparency. I mean. Surveillance itself, I think, is extremely concerning. Um, the, the idea that it's normal to be spied on, the idea that it's normal to have third parties monitoring our lives, collecting data about our lives, um, aggregating that and analyzing that on a daily basis without a knowledge or consent, that itself is terrifying. So, of course, it's not only about transparency, but, of course, in order to be able to tackle the main issue, I think transparency is one way to go. Um, the other question um, about um, agencies collaborating instead of competing. Um, yes, I definitely think it is mostly about, well, to some, to some degree it might be about competing, to another degree it might be about collaborating. It depends on where their interests lie, I guess, and depends on who's allies with who and what type of intelligence they want to acquire. Um, with regards to India in particular, um, well, yes, they, they have a, if I'm not mistaken, I think they have a mutual legal assistance treaty with Spain, which I kind of explained it to some extent, and with a whole bunch of other 34 countries. Um, and with these countries, of course, they can share intelligence data. 
And then the so in that sense, when when there when there are allies in terms of intelligence gathering. Uh, yes, there will be collaboration, and we have seen collaboration on, on multiple levels, even with the NSA, even like in the in the, the document that um, the Duncan showed earlier, with, with the 30 countries, with, with the 30 countries which provide direct access to fiber optic cables, which make up the backbone of the internet. So yes, we, we can see that multiple countries around the world, uh, the intelligence agencies do collaborate, and it kind of looks like intelligence agencies around the world are collaborating and creating this global surveillance ecosystem in a way. So it's not really about competing. I, I think. Like I said before, I think competing, competition has to do with um, with, with interests and w with your interest in the specific moment in time. Um, in the in the specific, for example, if we're talking about China and the U.S., then yes, there, there might be some competing interests, and I'm imagining that no, there's not that much collaboration as much as there is with other countries. So it really comes down to politics, some degree, I think, and a whole bunch of other factors. And yeah, so thanks. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, with regard to that question about whether uh, um, you know good intent, uh, originally it was good intent. I mean, the whole idea was in, in World War II, you had the UK and the US and Australians and most of the English-speaking world collaborating to break the uh, Enigma Code, the Purple Code in Japan, and so forth. And that was all well and good. And that was the whole idea of creating NSA was to continue that uh, that. Um, that expertise and not lose it. The problem is when uh, uh, we didn't have wars, we just had a Cold War, uh, to turn that not on uh, the, the Nazis, the Germans, or whatever, uh, but to turn it on the American public. And that's the problem. When you set up an agency, as I mentioned, that's outside the law, um, that can happen. And that's, that's the problem. Yeah, there was good intention when Truman set it up, but uh, you put presidents like Nixon and uh, Bush and, to a large degree, Obama in there, and uh, we've got uh, the situation we have. <clears throat> With regard to what Sai said earlier about the uselessness, I mean, I completely agree. The, uh, the agency came out at one point saying, well, we had 56 times where we were able to save the world. <clears throat> it came down once they, uh, the uh, Congressional Intelligence Committee started analyzing it, down to one instance, and it was a taxi driver in San Diego who sent $8,000 to some group in Somalia. So that's what we've gotten out of that big uh, system of years and years collecting all of the metadata and everything. Um, on the, uh, just on India, one, one quick uh, uh, thing on that is that <clears throat> people don't realize it, but when you're calling up American Express, for example, to find out about your bill or you're calling Bank AmeriCard, you're not talking to somebody in New York. You're talking to somebody in India. Uh, now, the difference is uh, the NSA can target that organization in India because it's a foreign organization running a foreign company. Um, what they're picking up, however, are all these Americans talking about bank accounts and so forth. So these are little loopholes you have to really look for. Uh, and the last thing on the privatization, um, yeah, that's the problem. You, you once had an agency that was all doing it itself. That was the NSA. And then after 9-11, they were just flooded with money. I mean, billions and billions and billions of dollars they didn't even know what to do with. So the only way they can do it, and since the physical planet NSA can only hold so many people, they began throwing that money all over the, uh, uh, the uh, private sector. And you have companies that nobody's ever heard of that are hiring people to do eavesdropping. The problem is none of those people have accountability. You can't send an FOI request to, uh, to Booz Allen. Uh, you, you can't have these people appearing before Congress. They're just private individuals. But they're listening to our conversations. And as Snowden showed, uh, uh, the NSA does such a poor job of keeping this information. Uh, who knows if this information doesn't get out to other people? So. Um, uh, again, I'm the person holding, uh, standing between you and lunch, so uh, I think I'll end it there and let everybody go back to lunch, uh, go out to lunch. Thanks very much. Thank you.